Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 80. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC, and today I have another interview for you in our Integrative Mental Health series. If you listened the past few weeks, you heard in episode 78, my interview with the wonderful Lainey Smith, who talked about eco art therapy. And Lainey is just such a fabulous therapist and her work sounds so exciting and interesting. And then in episode 79, I had the honor of interviewing Dr. Gabor Mate, who talked about the effects of traumatic stress over the developmental process and how that can affect us for our whole lives, including our mental, physical and emotional health and well-being. The reason why I mention episode 78 and episode 79 is because this episode, number 80, is my interview for the second time with Amy Sageno, LCSW. And this time, you might remember in a previous episode, Amy talked with me about attachment and I thought it was a fantastic interview. This time, Amy and I are going to talk about her work doing clinical ecotherapy in her practice. So when you put together Lainey's work with eco art therapy, Dr. Gabor Mate's discussion about traumatic stress and Amy's conversation with me about eco therapy, I think it's really kind of fascinating to put all of that information together and just really ponder how the work that these two therapists are doing combines with the research that we're hearing about traumatic stress and how these powerful interventions can make such a difference. So let's go ahead and get started with my interview with Amy Sugeno. And I have to apologize that the sound quality on this episode is really not up to par. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues and it doesn't sound as good as I would like it to, although I'll give a shout out to my wonderful producer, Pete, who tried to clean it up the best he could. Thank you, Pete. But hopefully you can ignore the poor sound quality so that you can really get the depth of the conversation that I had with Amy. I think it's really worthwhile. Thanks for listening. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am really excited to bring back someone who many of you have heard from recently on Therapy Chat. My guest today, for the second time, is the wonderful Amy Sugeno, LCSW, who is a clinical ecotherapist in Marble Falls, Texas. Amy, thanks so much for coming back on to Therapy Chat. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah, last time we were talking about attachment, and we got so involved in talking about that, we really didn't get to go in depth into ecotherapy, which I was originally planning on talking with you about, and I wanted to bring you back on so that our audience, I know we talked about it a little bit on that other episode, but I would like our audience to be able to hear more about what ecotherapy is and how you use it and what the research is on this method and why it's beneficial and who it helps and what it's like and all that good stuff. Yep, that, that sounds great. I'm ready. Awesome. So let's just start off, if you will, by can you just explain for people who are listening, what is ecotherapy? Yeah, well, so uh, ecotherapy is often referred uh, or talked about as an emerging field with ancient roots. And that was uh, something that one of the uh, pioneers in 
in this field, Craig Chalquist, um, he talks about it in that way. And it's basically any nature-based uh, intervention or, or nature-based therapy. So that could be um, animal-assisted therapy, equine therapy or canine or with any, any sort of uh, therapy animal, horticultural therapy, adventure therapy, and also wilderness therapy, uh, which can be thought of in different ways. Um, wilderness therapy is probably the way I work the most, which is in more wilderness-like settings, maybe like a state park or something like that, uh, where we basically take the work that we might do indoors in my office, but we're doing it outside. So nature becomes uh, like my co-therapist in a way. Um, so it's more of a depth psychology type of approach in that way. So, But any anytime you're bringing nature into the healing process or the therapeutic process, that's that falls under the umbrella of ecotherapy. Okay, so nature is your co-therapist. Yeah, and there's, so ecotherapy, because it is such an emerging field, there's, there's still a lot that's being worked out and a lot of uh, clinicians and also non-clinicians, other, other types of healing professions are using ecotherapy in a lot of different ways. So it's hard to really describe all the different ways. Some people stay on the topic of more like eco wellness and so they bring nature in as, to help physical health or emotional health so that might be like to lower blood pressure to reduce stress that that sort of thing so it's more about quality of life and, and wellness there's a lot of work around I'm not sure exactly what to call it but I think of it as sort of deep soul work so that might be things like vision quests uh, this is in the realm of uh, Earth-based healing. There's so the Animus Institute, and there's there's some others that, that are doing some really deep transformative type of work that might fall kind of into the purview of ecotherapy. And then there's clinical ecotherapists who are usually licensed clinical mental health uh, professionals who are bringing that kind of training and background, and then blending that into bringing nature in to also help with that that healing process. So that might be something like say, a licensed uh, social worker who wants to <clears throat> work with either an individual or, say, a group of women who have experienced uh, childhood sexual abuse, and then maybe you have the therapy happening outdoors, so you're bringing in that part of things, and maybe you're also looking at um, how the abuse has affected maybe attachment or being able to trust in relationships or something like that. So you're bringing in a really deeply clinical approach in with uh, what nature can also offer. Mm. It's very interesting. And so that is what you're doing. You're a clinical ecotherapist or licensed social worker, mm -hmm. licensed clinical social worker, and, and you're using nature. So I guess... How do you, what does the research say about this? How, how do we know, what do we know about its effectiveness? Yeah, so again, as an emerging field, uh, there's a lot of research behind how nature, being in nature, nature or even viewing pictures of nature affects the brain. Like uh, there's, there's been a lot of studies doing like a MRI sorts of brain imaging work whenever people look at a picture of, uh, nature. Now there's these like a uh, mobile imaging devices so you can actually go out into nature and researchers can measure uh, nature exposure more like in real time when you're actually outdoors. But as an emerging field there's a lot of research around that and there's more and more research around the actual ecotherapy especially more in the clinical ecotherapy realm. A lot of the research centers around depression and anxiety, um, stress relief, which is kind of intuitive for anybody who uh, enjoys nature or spends time in nature. It's, that's one of the first things you notice that you get out of that is you just get a sense of relaxation and uh, letting the stress kind of fade away. Um, but there's, there's a number of good studies on depression and how it can help to reduce rumination, which can be a difficult thing with when somebody's struggling with depression. That can be a symptom that happens where you go over something in your mind over and over and over again. Uh, so it can decrease rumination. And also there's, there's one really interesting study, and I want to say it was done in England, but I may be wrong about that, where they did cognitive 
therapy. And it was uh, one group was the control group. So they got cognitive behavioral therapy regular in the inside hospital setting like they would normally receive it. And the other group got the exact same type of therapy, but in a forested setting. And what this particular research uh, study found, which is a really good research design, and what this study found was that the people who were in the forested setting, that they had, a, that their depression went into remission and it stayed in remission for, I think they did like a six week or some kind of follow up and it stayed in, in depression, in remission. Um, in some cases, even better than what any depressants were able to accomplish as far as remission. Um, so there's some really great studies out there and more and more really robust studies are coming out uh, that are looking at things like, well, how, how much nature exposure is helpful for, say, stress relief or something. So that's, that's good stuff that's coming out. Um, yeah. So there's a variety of health benefits. And there's all these great, like, as far as more specific to therapy, um, there's things like, uh, of course, stress release, uh, stress relief. And also being able to be more resilient when you are experiencing stress, a decrease in anxiety and depression symptoms, especially from mild to moderate. Also things, re reduction in ADHD symptoms uh, with just being outside, promotes empathy, um, decreases impulsivity. One of the ones I think about a lot since I work a lot with trauma is the effect on the nervous system. So it helps to, there's some studies around that being in nature it helps to um, calm the nervous system and also helps to regulate um, our daily cortisol pattern. And cortisol, of course, it's a very complicated reaction, is stress, and, but one of the key hormones is cortisol. And so when we're under chronic stress, that gets dysregulated. And so being in nature can help to regulate our daily cortisol levels. So lots and lots of really great, great studies out there to support this work that we're doing. Yeah, and that's so important, too, about the cortisol, because we now know that, that with things like childhood abuse, you can have elevated levels of cortisol over your lifespan, and it can lead to all kinds of physical problems, physical illness. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's some really, I just was looking this up the other day, there's some really interesting research that's come out on what's called um, earthing or uh, grounding. And of course, a lot of therapists, that's a pretty, especially working with trauma, that's a really common tool, this idea of grounding. In other words, helping to calm the nervous system, maybe even literally touching something around you like your chair or something if you're starting to have some feelings of panic or fear or a little bit of re-traumatization or something like that. And so there's some really interesting research around uh, being in connection, like direct connection to the earth. So for most of us, that would be like going barefoot. Um, so you go to the beach and of course, it's kind of real common to take your shoes off and to walk on the sand. But it could also be, you know, especially if you live in areas where the, the grass is really green and soft, you might enjoy taking your shoes and socks off and feeling the grass under your, your feet. And so there's some really interesting research where the earth has an electrical field and that that electrical field, if we're in direct contact with it, like skin, you know, with our skin, that that comes up through our skin and actually does all this. And this is actually research from the medical community where it begins to re-regulate our, some of our like electrical. Um, so like the nervous system, also the endocrine system. So it seems like one of the directions that's going in is for people with chronic, chronic health, problems, maybe such as asthma or anxiety, diff different kinds of things, um, diabetes, heart, coronary heart, or uh, heart disease sorts of things, uh, that there may, be, there may be some help in being connected more directly to the earth, you know, walking with your feet or something like that. So the research is a little bit new, but uh, it's really fascinating, and especially because it comes from the medical community, where they do tend to do really rigorous studies. I've been kind of keeping an eye on that because it has a lot of really great implications. Absolutely. Have you heard, and if you haven't, then uh, don't worry about it, but have you heard about um, forest bathing? Yeah. Yeah. So that started, uh, originally, uh, originated in Japan. 
Um, I want to say in the early 1980s. So it's they were really uh, on the very forefront of this idea that, as far as in a more modern way, what I mean is that for thousands of years, people have been turning to nature for restoration and uh, stress relief and these kind of things. But in a more modern kind of like, you know, tapping into nature for very specific things like health benefits or in a more structured sort of way, yeah, the Japanese in the early 1980s began to not only advocate, so that my understanding is that the Japanese government actually was advocating for their citizens to please on your lunch break or after work or whatever, uh, we're going to set aside, there's these lands, these forests that we want you to go to and simply spend time out in nature. So it's different from like a guided hike where you're like maybe identifying birds or, or plants or something. It was more just go and be with nature, go sit next to a tree or go walk around and just be. So kind of a mindfulness sort of approach to being in nature. And the great thing about that too is they they have a ton of studies. So they began to study this, I guess, right from the start. They were doing lots of really good studies on how this was affecting people when they would go out into the forests. Now, interestingly, way before that, you know, hearing it, talking about like sanitariums where doctors um, would recommend when people had lung, uh, different lung illnesses, this was a hundred or so many years ago, they would say go out into the forest or they would send people to uh, sanitariums for health reasons. And it was thought that there was something, something helpful in the forest air was how I've seen it termed. And it turns out that, that there's really something to that. One of some of the Japanese research has found that that there are chemicals that that trees and and send off called phytoncides that are originally to protect the tree from various uh, uh, harmful things that can happen. Different, maybe uh, I don't know that much about trees, but different sorts of uh, you know things that can happen to trees that cause damage or cause a tree to get sick. So it protects the tree. Well, these phytoncides. They are emitted out into the air, out into the soil, uh, into the water. But when they're emitted into the air, there's some interesting studies around that that actually can provide uh, some help to us as well. Um, there's a few studies that talk about phytoncides being helpful for possible preventative effects uh, for cancer, that these phytoncides help to, to help to um, natural killer cells, which are really important to our body's own way of trying to fight cancer. So these are kind of early studies. Um, yeah, the forest bathing got us off into a really good, probably even with some of the beginning of this, this field. Yeah, well, thank you for explaining it, because I had never heard that term until I heard it a couple weeks ago on the day before I was going on a hike in the woods, and I really thought about it while I was walking and you know it was a guided hike though but still I was like just thinking how the air is different and it feels different in the woods in the forest when you're surrounded by trees mm -hmm. exactly you know I, I often say that I can't feel bad when I'm hiking like I I can't I can be all in turmoil and then I go hiking and I'm not I feel good and it's like, what was ever bothering me? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so as an ecotherapist, uh, there's so many different levels. If I was, if you were my client or if I was working with somebody, it could be that we go hiking or we go for a walk. I sometimes uh, do a little bit of work more on a volunteer level, but as a mental health professional, work with women who have been affected by breast cancer, uh, breast cancer diagnosis, and sometimes because of their treatment, or because of the diagnosis, they uh, are not able to, at that time, go on a long hike. And so there's also ways that, of doing ecotherapy, even indoors, or it might be that, you know, a, a homework assignment or something might be like sitting on your front porch or opening your window in your house if you're not able to really go outside, you know, for, for whatever different reasons. So ecotherapists can work on a lot of different levels uh, it doesn't have to be, I mean, being able to go on a hike is a great thing and a really rich source of, uh, you know, therapeutic processes and, and, and all. Uh, so that's a great thing, but it doesn't have to be that we go on a three-mile hike. It can be also just sitting by a creek 
um, or sitting at a park or, you know, something, something along those or, or doing indoor sorts of things as well. Yeah, that's really helpful to know because, you know, one of the things as a business owner that comes to my mind when you talk about ecotherapy is, you know, how do you structure that into a day's worth of therapy sessions? Is, do you just see one person per day? And that doesn't seem possible. So can you talk about, like, what that really looks like in your practice and how some of the different ways you do it and lengths of sessions and things like that? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of different ways. So it kind of, of course, depends a lot on your client, what they might be comfortable with or, or able to do or what you're able to do. But so there's a lot of different ways to approach that. One can be that, and this is probably what I do the most, <clears throat> is to simply meet my client uh, out at a, a trailhead at a park or something. And, and backing up from that, this is usually uh, – we might take at least a few sessions to maybe discuss this. And so it's not, it's not a therapy, especially if you are doing more of a deeper kind of clinical ecotherapy work with somebody, you don't want to just right out of the, you know, gate, just say, Hey, let's meet at this and such park. And we're going to go just take our therapy sessions outdoors because you don't, you want to do some assessment. What if your client uh, has had some trauma outdoors, whether that's, could be a sexual assault, but it could also be uh, they were uh, stung by a bee or something, and, and that was really frightening for them. Or a veteran who has spent a lot of time outdoors in combat, uh, certainly you would want to assess for that. A forested setting for a Vietnam veteran might not be real comfortable, or it might be, but again, the assessment process is what's going to help you with that. Uh, but once you determine, say, with your individual client, that yes, I, we, it's going to be good to, for your treatment to uh, do an ecotherapy session outdoors and the client is wanting to do that, they're ready for that, I'll usually meet them somewhere like at park headquarters and then we drive to the trailhead in our separate cars or we just meet at the trailhead and then we, uh, we go for a walk or we walk a little bit and then we sit maybe on a bench or a there's one place I go where there's a lake, so there's, we can sit by the lake, and we simply do the counseling session outdoors, except now I'm bringing in nature as a, a co-therapist, so clinically there's a lot, it, it, it sort of looks the same, but there's a lot of different stuff that can come up to when you, ha when you have nature as a co-therapist. Uh, your affect as a therapist changes, of course, you're dressed differently, P perhaps you're wearing jeans or, you know, hiking pants or something. So that's one way that I commonly will work with people. Uh, but sometimes I work with groups, um, and I, t I tend to work more uh, on a, I guess you'd say like a superficial level. So it could be like a mindfulness in nature group session. So we're not going to go deep down into deep therapeutic, you know, issues, but I want to help people to connect with nature in a mindful way so that they can then do that at home or they can begin a mindfulness practice and they can have nature as a part of that if they want to. Um, so that's kind of a different way that I work. And then indoors, if we need to stay, like I, in my office, I have a bunch of uh, nature sorts of things like um, sticks and cattails and rocks and sand and different things. So sometimes we're just working with the nature items that are there in my office. And that really just depends on the client. Some clients aren't interested in that at all. And some are like, well, what is this? And uh, I have a, <clears throat> a bucket of sand that came from the beach that I dug up. And that for people who have a lot of anxiety, uh, they li sometimes like to have that sand on their lap just to kind of play with really like as they're talking. And that can be something that helps to calm a little bit of their anxiety. And then finally, homework, especially if a client um, already really maybe enjoys nature, has spent time in nature, and really likes, wants to do this, you can give a homework assignment such as maybe, maybe your client identifies a particular creek that, that's easy for them to get to, and they <clears throat> might like to spend some time next to that creek, and so you can talk about what the homework would look like. Maybe it's mindfulness, or maybe it's just simply sitting by the creek one day a week or, or however much. Um, and they can kind of like check in with how they're doing before, like when they first get out of the car and <clears throat> then when they're done with sitting next to the Creek, they can kind of check back and see if it's helped check in with their body and see if that has helped say their anxiety, for instance. 
Um, so those are all kinds of different ways that I tend to work. Uh, there's a whole really rich field of horticulture therapy that I don't do a lot with just because it's not as much my area, but for people who do really enjoy plants or gardening, this can be a fantastic, really great, rich area. Um, I think that you could do indoors, you could of course do outdoors, and then also animal assisted therapy, which I used to do. My dog is retired now, but of course, uh, animal assisted therapy is a really big, very big field as well. Since I work more in wilderness settings, I actually kind of tend to bring in, uh, if we are, if a lizard runs by or a deer or something like that, then if it seems if it seems important, then that's something that we can kind of talk about. Like, oh, I noticed that we're, you know, there's a deer that has come up here and what is that like for you? And sometimes nothing comes up, up with that, but sometimes really interesting and surprising things will come up just by the visiting of a particular animal, a bird that flies by or something like that. Yeah. So th- is, would you call that animal assisted therapy or ecotherapy that the animal, the wild animal is part of it? Yeah, I, I don't know that, uh, I hadn't really thought about if it would be called animal assisted therapy because that feels like a whole different mm-hmm. uh, world that's more with domesticated animals. Is, yeah, it seems more directive with the animal too. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but certainly, you know, if you have a, a wild animal come up, one of the real common ones, at least where I am, is like butterflies or birds that come by. And sometimes that's really meaningful for a client. A particular, um, like I've had a few clients talk about dragonflies. If we're next to a creek and a dragonfly comes up and lands on a, like a little stick or something like that. And for some clients, that's a really meaningful thing. And they'll talk about uh, why that's so meaningful for them. And maybe it has to do with, um, I'll just kind of make this up. It, oh, my, when my mother died, uh, you know, I saw a, a dragonfly and she loved dragonflies. And I really felt like that that was her way of communicating with me, so, something to that effect. Yeah. And so that, that gives you some real richness into, you know, rich material to work with. For other people, a dragonfly going by doesn't, doesn't evoke that same sort of thing. But maybe a lizard does. Or maybe if you're lucky enough to have, say, like a fox run by or uh, a hawk or an owl come and land like in the tree pretty close to you like that can certainly uh, if nothing else just be really exciting and so that can lead into um, discussions about maybe how helpful it is just to be pulled into that mindfulness of that animal that really wonderful owl that just landed right there just pulls you right into mindfulness and that can be a launching point for how nature can really help in a mindfulness practice if that's something that your client uh, might be interested in. Or for some clinicians, and if the client seems to really benefit and enjoy this, you can really go down a path of sort of like, and this gets more into that deeper soul work of kind of like animal medicine. Uh, And some clients are not going to be, you know, want this at all. And some really get into this and it's really helpful for them talking about, you know, I feel like that my spirit animal or my power animal has always been a hawk. And so then you can talk about, well, what does that mean to you? What is a hawk? Is it, you know, is a hawk really powerful? Is a hawk really, it's got great eyes. And so is that, you know, as far as like visioning or uh, clarity, I mean, so you can get into a lot of really rich metaphors with animal medicine, as well as metaphors with the landscape. For instance, uh, I sometimes will go out to Big Bend. I haven't taken clients out there, but for my own self, go out to Big Bend National Park. And one time I was hiking and there was the rock formations were such that there was like a little narrow gap in between two rocks that looked out onto this really vast desert. So it was kind of like this narrow view onto a big, wide open expanse that was further out. And I remember thinking if I was with a client, you know, we could talk about that particular metaphor um, of uh, that narrow view opening into a wider view and see what, you know, kind of comes up with that around maybe feeling uh, restricted in how you feel right now, or, or maybe that could be being able to see what you want out of your life in the distance or, or something like that. Yeah. Of course, it depends on what comes up for the client. But I, I work a lot with metaphors in that, in that particular way, whether it's an animal that comes up 
uh, or flies by or something, or whether it's, you know, a particular tree or the landscape itself. I, I like to ask people sometimes, uh, what's catching your attention right now? There's all these things around us, trees and rocks and the sky and maybe flowers. What's, what's catching your attention? And uh, they'll always come up with something, you know, they're, they'll kind of look around and they'll make, somebody might say, well, that, that tallest tree over there that's standing all by itself, you know, that, that, I just think that's really great. Like I just can't help but, uh, really be pulled in, you know, really draws my attention. So then I'm thinking, okay, a tree, a tall tree all by itself, is that attachment related? Uh, something about being all by yourself? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, is there something about being the tallest tree? Is there something about wanting to be kind of like more known or more visible, taller than you feel right now? Uh, so you kind of get the idea of where something like that could go. Yeah. That's so beautiful the way you talked about it. And, you know, I don't know about this because you are the one who knows about ecotherapy and I don't. So tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels like you're bringing in more intuition and inner wisdom into the therapy, therapeutic process through, I guess, that grounding in nature. Yeah, uh, it, it is an extremely intuitive. Well, let me kind of back up it. The way that I work tends to be very intuitive like that. Mm. I rely a lot on my intuition. And some of that is experience from having taken a lot of people out as well. But if you also were just mainly staying on the level of, say, eco-wellness, um, it doesn't have to necessarily be such an intuitive process. If your client is struggling with depression and, say, mild depression or moderate depression, and they feel like, and you feel like it would be helpful for them to spend some time outside. Maybe they have a garden that they have not been working in, and so maybe that's part of their homework. Like, that's not a real highly intuitive sort of thing. I mean, it's a little bit intuitive just by the way of uh, that nature can be helpful, but it, it's not like the deep sort of intuitive sorts of processes. Now, I will say that I don't often meet clients for ecotherapy like I was talking about that deeper intuitive process until we've been doing a lot of work inside mm -hmm. so that I already have some idea a, a pretty good idea of what they're struggling with um, I might already have um, some different sort of working theories about say their attachments or different things that I we haven't quite gotten to in therapy, but I really have a feeling that getting outside, I'm going to get a clearer picture of these things I've kind of been wondering about about them. And so that's another part of it is doing that deeper work. It's really helpful if you already have a good working relationship with your, your client. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like um, one point I've heard you say is that it's not – one size fits all approach and it's you know it can be used in different levels of depth but when you've been working with someone very deeply clinically in your office using ecotherapy out in nature can be a way to deepen that process even further absolutely absolutely because you you see, you can see your client in a a much different sort of way sometimes and I imagine some of that's because they see you differently. Again, maybe you're wearing different clothes. Your affect is a little bit different or maybe like you're wearing, you know, sunglasses or something. So you look different. And so maybe that just kind of also brings out something different. But something about being outdoors, you just, it, maybe it's, maybe a good way to think about it is if you, the way that you are with your own child or hanging out with a friend at, at a coffee shop or something, if you go on a hike together, it's just going to feel a little bit different. You're going to maybe talk about different things or something like that. It's kind of maybe a way to sort of think about it where you just see each other through a different lens. And that brings up different sorts of richness and affect. And uh, I've gotten a lot of information about my clients as far as kind of assessment sorts of, of things and being able to see more of what feels like could be kind of the core of who they are, like maybe defenses come down just a little bit when, when we're outdoors. And that doesn't mean outdoors is always 
always go outside with every single client because sometimes that's not what seems like is going to be necessary for their treatment or appropriate for their treatment. So I don't mean to say that every single client needs to, we need to go outdoors. It re, it's just like any approach. You want to use what you feel is clinically appropriate for their treatment. Yeah. I love this though. And I'm thinking too that there's a vulnerability to the fact that you're both outside. You know, you may be hiking and you're out of breath. You're not just the person who's got it all figured out. You don't have control of the whole environment. So you don't know what's going to happen as a therapist. It's a vulnerable situation for both people in, but on an equal footing instead of kind of the way it is in a therapy office you know, my therapy room, I strive to make it a safe space, but it's my space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a power differential to that. And that's just part of the process. It's just like when you go to your doctor's office, they're the doctor, you're the patient. You have, you have power, but you are on their terms, you know, and it kind of feels like that. So I think being out together in a space where, you know, you both bring strength to the experience and you both have a level of trust and not being sure what's going to happen but you know going with it oh yeah that that brings up such a great a couple several great points one is what you were talking about that power differential that you can we can make our offices just as comfortable and warm as we want to but as you say there's still our office, it's still kind of like our turf, I guess. Mm -hmm. But nature, being outdoors, is nobody's, uh, it's shared equally. It's not mine any more than it is my clients. Mm -hmm. And so, and also, a lot of the work, uh, just if you're hiking or sitting down or something, tends to be a little bit more side by side, so you're not like facing each other like you might more in a office setting. And for some people, that can be really helpful to be a little bit more like, hiking side by side, or if it's a really narrow trail, it might be one in front of the other. And so that can be sort of interesting, like which does your client prefer to be led or to lead? Like that can be kind of interesting stuff. Your client can also decide how far away they want to be from you if you're outdoors. Whereas in the office, typically, at least adults and teens, uh, you have like the client's chair or maybe a couple of chairs or something to choose from. And then your chair, it's like a set distance but in if you're hiking or something your cl I've had clients sometimes stand you know pretty far away from me and I thought well I didn't realize that you know that this is this would be so uncomfortable for them uh, I wonder what it must be like in my office where they can't regulate their own amount of space Mm -hmm. me. So that gives me this great information and sometimes I can monitor through different outdoor sessions like do they end up getting closer and closer in space to where it's more of a normal amount of space like I would stand next to a friend or do they remain really far away from me. Uh, so these so there's all kinds mm -hmm. so, so that it becomes the process also becomes a lot more so it's first of all a lot more sensory. Uh, it's a it's a very alive kind of process. You have animals that come by, like a butterfly or something. You may not know if it's going to rain. There's a lot that it's it's always kind of shifting and moving. You just like you said, you never know what's really going to happen. You can probably predict, you know, for the most part what's going to happen, but you never know uh, what might come up. I've, I've had sessions where a, a little snake has come across the path or something like that and you know I mean so that brought up a lot of great stuff and uh, we had lots of good discussions that's happened a few times and of course that's something that just can't be replicated obviously in the office hopefully <laughs> the snake coming through the office but yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that vulnerability I think is also a really great point and just like any sort of way that a therapist might use themselves as a tool. So that might be somatic information or that might be self-disclosure, anything like that. Vulnerability can be used. And so mm -hmm. for some clients, they don't want to feel like that their therapist is very vulnerable at all, perhaps. They really need to feel your solidity or your steadiness or something. You know, for another client, I, I found this especially with teenage clients, they really, they like it when I'm, uh, having and when we're walking up a hill and I'm breathing hard and yeah. they sort of think it's funny and so that's a great little kind of you know relationship builder I, I use it to my advantage in the sense of like you know I'm really out of breath here I'm gonna have to take a break and 
you know, they'll sort of get a giggle out of it. And I'm using it very, well, it's a true thing if I'm out of breath, but I'm also using it as a place of, of building a little bit of connection. Like, hey, I'm a human too. You know, I'm not, I'm not inter- my own style. I'm not interested in like having all this power over you and telling you what to do, my teenage client I'm, or my adult client. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in forming a, a therapeutic relationship with you so that, you know, we can figure out what's going to be helpful to you. So it becomes more collaborative. That's just my own style, mm-hmm. of course. Yeah. Mine is like that too. Because I think it's, it can be, you know, it can be disarming because and, and in a genuine way, not in a way to try to have power over the other person, but to, to admit, I don't really have any control over you. I don't have control over, you know, how you feel, what you do, and I don't want to. I just, I do have some skills that I can use to help you, and we're in this together kind of thing instead of, you know, that. I mean, the part of the power differential is, is just unavoidable. But as much as I can do to try to show that I'm not interested in having more power, I just want to be able to help. And I feel like it's a privilege to do that. But sharing some of yourself is a really nice way, I think, for clients who are comfortable with it to, um, to let them know where you stand. Absolutely. And <clears throat> that, this idea of uh, we're in this together in terms of maybe, you know, we're kind of like in this thing that we call life as humans together. Uh, Again, if if that's what would be helpful for the client to have that kind of feeling about the relationship, that what a great mirror nature can be because say you're hiking along, you are experiencing that particular session moment by moment together in the sense that I don't know if a butterfly is going to fly by or if a snake, if we might come across a snake or whatever that might happen, there's there's some amount that I, I feel like I can kind of predict what's going to happen, but I, there's a lot that I don't really know what's going to happen once we're outdoors. Uh, now, I'm not going to take, obviously, a client to a place where I feel like there's going to be a lot of things that aren't safe. I don't mean that, but mm-hmm. but in that way of kind of like discovering things as we go along, which would be, I think, a little bit harder to happen in an office, per- perhaps. Yeah. Well, Amy, this has been another fascinating discussion, and I'm so grateful to you for talking to our listeners today about ecotherapy. For people who want to know more about what you're doing, where will they find you? Yeah, so I have a a website, and I'm in the process of creating another website that's just for my ecotherapy work, but that's, it's going to take me a while to get all that together, but eventually I'll have a new website. But so for now, people are welcome to go to my website or, you know, contact me by, contact me by phone or email. Uh, I'd be happy to give some, especially clinicians. I have like a little handout that's like uh, with some resources, articles and books and different things. If somebody would like to know more about that, and then I wanted to also mention that there, I, I'm going to be starting to do some trainings, and of course those will be here in my area, Marble Falls, Austin, Texas area. But there is a, a kind of an advanced level training, level two training, that I teach with another co-therapist, uh, another uh, ecotherapist, we co-teach it. Uh, and she teaches most of it, and then I help teach certain parts of it. And that'll be coming up next summer. It's a five-day, like, really immersive, experiential, gain lots of tools and practice and just all kinds of things, as well as self-care and personal growth. Uh, and that's going to be in Virginia next summer, in 2017, at the end of July. And that's, uh, we did it last year for the first time, and it was really successful. It filled up, and it was, we just, it was great. And all these great collaborations have come out of that. So if somebody's really interested in, and this can be for clinicians or for other types of healers, professional healers. Uh, it's open to both anybody who wants to bring nature-based therapies and healing modalities into their work. Um, so if somebody's interested in that, for sure, just have them give me a call or, or email or something. I'd be, definitely love to talk to them because the early bird uh, rate is ending here pretty soon. Uh, okay. So anyway, so that's another little Thing that's exciting because there's not anything really else that I know of that's that's like this kind of training and that's why we do it yeah it sounds wonderful and this um, will be in 
the summer of 2017. So people who are listening will have some time to sign up before missing out, hopefully even within the early bird time frame too. Yes, and there is a, the other person who's we were teaching it together. She's doing more. Uh, she takes care of the, the administrative types, you know, signing up and that kind of stuff. And she's offering offering a diversity scholarship as well as some work study options too. So to help reduce some of the cost for, but it's kind of a first come first serve, of course, sort of sort of thing. Wonderful. So can people get that from your website too? I don't think it's posted on my website, although that's a good idea um, <laughs> uh, to post that link. We're just kind of getting going with beginning to advertise for that. But for sure, people can contact, can email or call, and I can direct them right away to the link. And then I will, uh, here in the next few weeks, I'll try to remember to get that actually posted up on the website as well. Wonderful. Amy, thank you so much. It's been a joy to have you back on Therapy Chat, and I look forward to connecting with you more soon. Oh, thank you, Laura. I had a great time talking with you. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Amy Sugeno. If you did not get a chance to listen to episodes 78 and 79, or Amy's prior interview with me on attachment, and you want to, you will find links to those in the show notes, which are on my website, therapychatpodcast.com. And you can find every episode of Therapy Chat on therapychatpodcast.com. So if you want to go back and listen to some you missed, you'll find them all there. You can also find podcast episodes on YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio. Some are on SoundCloud. So enjoy. Thanks again for listening. Hi, I'm Laura Reagan, host of Therapy Chat, and I'm a trauma therapist in private practice outside of Baltimore. I specialize in helping clients with complex trauma related to childhood abuse or loss or attachment trauma during childhood. And I also specialize in helping survivors of sexual assault and childhood sexual abuse. So this is not easy work and it can be very isolating, which is why I created two online communities for trauma therapists. Trauma Therapists Unite is a Facebook group that is secret and only for licensed clinicians. And the idea of Trauma Therapists Unite is a community and space for support and sharing resources getting connected with other trauma therapists, and building your own network of people who support you, whether they're local to your area or not. I've made some great friendships online with other therapists through Facebook, but not all of them are trauma therapists. So I think there's a need for a space where trauma therapists can gather. And then when you want to do clinical consultation, since we can't do that in a Facebook group, you can say, hey, is anybody available at five o'clock to talk on the phone about a tough case I had? Or, hey, I'm available and I would love to support anyone who's seeking consultation today. Or, hey, you're in my area. Let's meet for coffee and brainstorm about our work and share support and connection. So, Trauma Therapists Unite is a free Facebook group for that purpose. It is not for clinical consultation because we cannot share client information in a Facebook group. We all know that. But because of the isolating nature of trauma work, especially when you're in private practice, but in agencies too, it can be very isolating because it's kind of the nature of trauma work. So with that isolating nature in mind, I created Trauma Therapists Unite for us to gather, support one another, and share resources. And I hope you will join us. There is a process to join the group that includes providing information about your credentials. And all of that information is in the group. So when you request to join, you'll see the rules. The other resource that I wanted to tell you about is a paid membership community, the Trauma Therapist Community, which includes online clinical consultation off Facebook using a secure platform of video sessions once a month. 
and more if desired. And groups are also available in person. So check my website, lauraregan.lcswc.com slash join for all the information about the trauma therapist community. Thanks so much for your support. Hope to see you there. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.